G'day Marcus, once again I'd like to welcome you to TWISC. It's very interesting times, we're only uh, about 100 days from a state election, so there's lots of issues to talk about. So, um, shall we start with the FIFA, this issue about the FIFA and the women's soccer? What was happening yeah, sure. down there? Yeah, sure. So in 2019 and the 2019 council and the uh, local football club there down in Port Melbourne and FIFA came to a an agreement to use that site at Murphy's Reserve. So the oval, the um, sorry, the soccer pitch at JL Murphy Reserve as a training facility for the Women's World Cup in 2023. What's unfortunately happened since then is there's been a deterioration in the ground over the past, particularly the last 12 months. Uh, it was in terrific condition about a year ago, but with the increased amount of usage uh, post COVID, the amount of rain that's gone through and also the maintenance practices that could, could have been better, the condition of the ground has worsened to a point where it no longer meets FIFA standard. And unfortunately, our officers made the decision in early August um, with the agreement of FIFA that it would no longer be um, suitable to use that pitch as a training facility for the Women's World Cup, which is exceedingly disappointing. And again, I apologise to the club and all the people involved about the way uh, we handled the communication of this issue. It should have been better, and I apologise for that. So is it only the communication that's a problem? Is not the management of the Oval a problem? We're, councillors are looking into it at the moment and I've written a letter today to the to the club to ask them to come in so I can learn more from their experience. Uh, as you're aware, Greg, we had a meeting with the club and probably 100 people on Sunday to hear firsthand uh, their grievances about it. But you know, councillors have asked for some more reports about what's happened to the ground maintenance in the past 12 months in particular. And when I have that information, I'll, I'll, I'd like to share it with the club. Okay, well, another issue that seems to be emerging is the progress of the works on the Palais Forecourt. Now, apparently I've heard that there was an undiscovered drain was discovered and that those works may now be extended in their timeline and may go right over summer. So what's the story there? But firstly, the Palais Forecourt and Luna Park Forecourt, um, we got funding from the state government, which we're very, very grateful for. Uh, to improve the street and scape and also um, extend the park land in that area. So what we started those works off and we've worked out that there's a storm water component there that needs to be upgraded. We're in the process at the moment to making sure we're scoping that out properly, but we've temporarily halted the works at the Palais Forecourt and at the front of Luna Park. Uh, and those works are gonna be delayed now because of that additional complexity with the storm water. That's a concern because it means the project will go into the summer months now. So what we're doing is working particularly with Luna Park to make sure that the um, fencing around the site can be reduced and that a clear pathway can be put into both the Palais and Luna Park to make sure people feel and understand that both of those businesses are operating as normal and it's warmed and open. But uh, we're working through uh, the problem at the moment regarding the stormwater drain upgrade. Um, we don't want to keep on building because ultimately if you have to do that upgrade, we don't want to build something and then pull it up. But it does mean that that project's been delayed and as soon as we have an updated timeline, we'll make sure we communicate that to everybody. Now, how does this... Uh, I understand that Live Nation is also obliged to do some programming in the external programming there in the car park. Is, will that be affected by this? No, it won't be. So that's going to go ahead as per normal? Yes. Okay, so the, what effect will that have on car parking at that site? Uh, in terms of the project or the temporary work? The, no, the, the Live works. Nation works uh, I, on the triangle. I don't know specifically how many car parks will be impacted by it, but I'll happily come back and um, give you an update okay. on that. Okay, well, we'll follow that as that comes along. So, right. um, So I guess the next one that I'm interested in is so we've got a number of councillors standing in the state election, uh, at least Catherine Copsey and Louise Crawford and maybe more. Um, what's the status of those people as councillors while they're standing as candidates? 
it's something we're very experienced in and there's a, a couple of guidelines and regulations that rule it. Um, both Councillor Copsey and Councillor Crawford have declared in an open council meeting that they've received endorsement from political parties and that they will run as candidates in the state election. Councillor Crawford is running for the seat, lower house seat of Brighton and Councillor Copsey is running for the Australian Greens in the upper house seat of Southern Metro region. So they'll take leave for the period of the um, uh, once the election is opened and declared. So we're in the election, the formal election campaigning period, and they both understand their obligations through code of conduct and conflict of interest, etc. Um, before that period, so they will act in their duties uh, as councillors, and they'll balance the responsibility of being a councillor with also their potential conflict of being a candidate, but. We're pretty experienced in this. We've had this happen a few times in the past, and I think um, we, we can manage it. As mayor, it's something I will monitor very, very closely. But what we also want to do is make sure we utilise the advantage of having those two candidates advocating on behalf of the City of Port Phillip. So I'll also be, as mayor, working closely with Councillor Crawford and Councillor Copsey to make sure that we can get as much um, leverage through the state election from all political parties. Okay, so all you need now is a Liberal councillor. Then yeah, you'd have it all think, covered. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't think. I, I don't. I haven't had any conversations with anybody else that's looking to run at the moment. Um, so I, I, I don't think anyone else will put their hand up. But, but who knows? Who knows? Okay, so well, that leads us to the question of election advocacy, which uh, is always a very important time for local government. So. Uh, t tell me what's the top advocacy priorities? So my core job this year as mayor, other than doing what mayors do, has been to um, you know, put our best foot forward with the state and federal governments through the federal election and now the state election. So we have a, a great team of people working behind the scenes here uh, doing election advocacy. And uh, we've got lots of materials such as this here, which clearly articulate what council's core priorities are and what this council needs um, to sustain growth into the future. The key issues we're focusing on with state um, candidates at the moment is early childhood um, uh, care and the money we're seeking there for upgrades to new facilities as well as existing facilities, um, social and affordable housing and post COVID economic recovery on top of a number of other things around particularly transport. So you know, we've got very large issues in our municipality around transport and then also sustainability and also um, renewable energy, et cetera. So there's a lot, lot to be covered off on, but we've had some terrific conversations with some ministers. Uh, the state opposition's also been fantastic and they've already come up with some promises uh, around um, the childcare services in the past few months. We're, we're working closely with each other but there's still a long way to go, albeit we're 100 days out. We're very well positioned in terms of the advocacy we've done over the past six months, but there's still a long way to go. One of the key parts of that advocacy, obviously, Greg, is um, something you're involved in, which is the Metropolitan Transport Forum. Yeah, well, I, first I was going to start with the childcare, actually. So your decision not to sell the childcare places is pending other funding sources. So that's how this all links into the state election. So we had a confidential meeting on, uh, a confidential item come to council meeting last Wednesday, where the sale of the three centres that was out for consultation was taken off the table. Um, and that's subject to uh, rebuilding or refurbishment of those facilities, um, subject to funding from the state and federal government, which we, we it's it's obvious we we don't have those agreements in place at the moment, but we felt it was important that we communicated with the centres so they had surety moving forward. But what I would say is we've been working well with all parties uh, politically. I mean, and the, as I mentioned before, the opposition has come up with a a funding scenario, but we're also working very closely and productively with the Victorian government, which is going well, and we've also had discussions at the highest level with the Australian government. So I'm very encouraged about those funding discussions. And um, as soon as we have uh, further news, I'll make that announcement publicly. So might that include 
the three childcare centres plus the North St Kilda childcare centre that the council is building? I can't go into the details because it's it's confidential at the moment, Greg. Okay, but could the scope include the North St Kilda Centre as well? Yeah, I, I won't be I won't be baited by it, but okay. Um, oh no, that was that was, that was very <laughs> gentle. I thought. No, I, I, it, it's a delicate time in terms of our negotiations and funding agreements, and I don't want to do anything that would even come close to jeopardising that. Okay, and. In the social housing area, what are the asks there? Yeah, uh, City Port Phillip has a very proud um, track record of performance and results in this area, um, but there's a there's a few things that are obviously needed. So uh, one thing is particularly around affordable housing and the increase and in uplift in affordable housing and how that potentially works in precincts such as Fisherman's Bend but also pathways for um, acute homelessness. So as you know, Port Phillip has a, a terrific program um, called Port Phillip Zero, which is a service provision. Uh, and ultimately there's two pathways out of homelessness. Well, there's multiple pathways out of homeless homelessness, but there's two, the evidence says there's two key factors. Um, the first thing is stable employment and, and, and equally a, a stable house. Uh, somewhere for somewhere to live. So the only way these problems are going to be solved um, in our municipality and across Australia is, you know, solid pathways to employment and solid pathways for people to have affordable housing um, and some form of permanent security. So that's what we've been advocating for many, many years, and that's what we'll continue to do so. Okay, well, moving on to the transport asks, because, of course, this is relevant because there's a forum on the 6th of September at the town hall that you're chairing yep. with... Um, well, would you want to give some more details on that? Because I think it's obviously... Um, pretty yeah, important. well, well, let's tell say who's uh, on the panel there. So it's David Davis, who's the upper house. Uh, well, he's the shadow treasurer and the upper house member for the Liberal Party. Yep. Sam Hibbins, who's the MLA for Paran and uh, Nina Taylor, who is currently the MLC, which is the upper house member, but is seeking to transfer to the lower house seat of Albert Park. So there's a, a sitting member from each of the three parties are going to present their transport visions. You're going to chair. What do you think the issues are that will come up at that forum? Yeah, there's, a, there's some key ones. Metro 2, which has been in the news in the past week uh, through Sally Capp's advocacy and also as the most logical alternative to the suburban rail link. Um, the, the long history of Melbourne's workforce and social life moving from east to west and it's time for another river crossing in terms of a rail crossing. So having Metro 2 connect the east to the west economic social transport hubs is uh, just the, the biggest no-brainer that any, anyone can ever pitch. And as an alternative to the suburban rail link, I think it stacks up very, very well. So that's one, but it's a very large and long-term one. Oh, well, and we're just, working closely. well, before we Sorry. leave that one, I think it's worth explaining to the big connection to Port Phillip for that is that it includes a station in Fisherman's Bend that then links up right up to... Clifton Hill and all to, to all the rest of the railway lines. Well, and particularly over to the other side and into the west. Yeah, to Hobson's so, Bay, uh, yeah. Yeah, I've been working closely with the Mayor of Hobson's Bay and also Sally Cat to um, advocate for this, and it's a game changer, a generational change, and it makes a lot of sense. So it's something we need to keep on pushing for. But also, before that, the, a tram link into Fisherman's Bend is critically important for the employment precinct on the river side, sorry, the yeah, the river side of the Westgate Freeway, but also the um, suburban Port Melbourne side also. It's a very key thing, um, and that will require some form of bridge crossing across the Yarra River. Then we've got some other items which are, are smaller, but nonetheless uh, very, very important. More details around the Park Street tram link is important about what trams will be running there and, and what routes formerly will be operated under there. The duplication, the smart duplication and upgrade to the 109 um, into Port Melbourne is also 
uh, critically important. And then also some road, road initiatives like the upgrade to the Broadway br um, bridge um, that we need also, which is you know several millions of dollars that we're advocating for. So there's a long list of transport items, uh, but they're all focused around particularly the, the future community with some big spends as we move out of Metro, the, the project completion for Metro to one. Okay, and there's also some suggested works on St Kilda Junction uh, and to make the also. yeah. Now I'm in, I'm interested too in that uh, the St Kilda Road is going to get a lot of attention soon with the extra bike lanes and the junction, but um, I'm interested in when more low floor trams will start operating in other parts of the city. It's like we have 96 and 16 have low floor trams, but there's a lot of other tram routes in Port Phillip that don't have any low floor trams, like the Route 67 and the Route 3A. Um, so do you know... And, well, and the 12, but the 12's got um, predominantly, um, well, some some low, um, accessible tram stops, admittedly, but they still, they still can't get on there with a wheelchair. Yeah, that's right. So, um, well, those but, things, will, that will come up at the meeting, I'm sure. They will. There's a couple of things where we're, obviously most of this sits within the Department of Transport, but uh, number one is your council needs to be advocating for these, and we are. The second thing is we need to be working with the Department of Transport to make sure the infrastructure is there. So a lot of those trams have a much more higher power load than the old generation trams, so substation upgrades are required, and we're working with the DOT um, to get better outcomes for those. Those of you who remember, there was a substation put on the St Kilda Junction, which, OK, isn't the most beautiful place in the world um, compared to what it used to be, um, but putting that substation there in the way they did it was a very poor outcome, in my opinion. Uh, we're working with the Department of Transport, who's done a good job so far to ensure those sorts of mistakes uh, don't happen in the future. But we also get the benefit of making sure that infrastructure is put on place so those new trams can run on those lines. OK, well, the relationship with the Department of Transport is obviously very important. So that links us to the question of the bike lanes across Port Phillip and, you know, I think, you know, even... Though I might be pro bike lane myself, seems yep. to have been quite controversial. So, what do you think the learnings are from that? We're working closely with the Department of Transport at the moment on uh, a lot of community feedback that's been received about the bike lanes, and uh, we've actually I've formally written to the um, Secretary of the Department of Transport requesting specific changes to. Um, well, in particular, two pop-up bike lane areas, uh, which we have immediate safety concerns around, and those discussions have been having with our officers and the Department of Transport are going well. So we're seeking changes to the pop-up bike lane program, which, uh, from all reports that I'm hearing, albeit I haven't been involved in them, are going quite well. Uh, in terms of the learnings, I think it's fair to say that... Um, when we're in partnership or when the council is in a form of partnership with the state government, uh, councillors probably um, should have asked some more questions of the process. I, I personally, I, I feel that I should have asked some more questions early on about what the process was and probably had a few more gates in place around the decision making um, to ensure that we were clear on what we were getting uh, and what our community views on this were. Yes, well, I think we've discovered there are bike lanes and bike lanes. There are bike infrastructure and bike infrastructure of so many different sorts and different colours. So moving right along then to Indeed. another issue that came up at Council this week was uh, another step forward on the triangle, which was deferred. So can you tell me, one, what was going to happen and why was it deferred? This process has been started by a councillor, by Councillor Bond, and supported by most councillors, which is why we're here, about moving, um, re well, re reinstating the triangle as a strategic project within council to start moving it forward. So what's happened at the last meeting is there's some options in terms of what the next steps would be about potentially going out 
and seeking to see if there's any interest in the site. Um, the, the item was deferred because Councillor Bond and a number of other councils, including myself, want some more detail around costings and risks of that process. So there's a number of different options we can go through, and we have some good experience with this now, obviously through the learnings of the triangle process a decade ago, but also the St Kilda Marina. Uh, so there's different ways we can get the feedback from the community to make sure we're informing any RFP process that we go for but it's um, fair to say that councillors have asked for more detailed information about what the risks are and more importantly, obviously, what the cost would be to council and ratepayers. So that's why the item was deferred and I expect it to come back for another conversation in two weeks' time. Okay, so I read that paper and it seemed to me mostly focusing on the, you know, it was $600,000 for a look at the cost of a car park but didn't seem to have any other ideas in it so you know where are we going with that one that, that that's um that's it we're in the hands of councillors in terms of how they want to provide direction and that will be coming in the uh next meeting or the meeting thereafter so okay. um watch this space is what i'd say to you agree but it's been driven obviously by councillors so that what officers do from here on in um we are the decision makers uh, but this uh, this course of action has been originated out of um, council emotion, so it, it does have a slightly different process. Well, the process is the same, but you don't understand what I'm saying in terms of um, it's up to councillors to work out what the next stage of direction is on the advice of the officers. Okay, so Marcus, is there any issues that you'd like to raise, or have we covered the list pretty comprehensively? Covered, um, covered everything pretty well. It's been a busy month in council land, Greg, um, and uh, there's still a lot to go, but as we head into the state election, as you said, 100 days or so from now, we'll be working as hard as we possibly can, can to get the best deal for our ratepayers. Um, we, we've met with lots of people from the Liberal Party, from the Labor Party, and we're starting to meet with the Greens representatives as, as they're being announced, um, and I'll meet with anybody uh, that uh, wants to talk to us about our advocacy priorities and what we can do uh, to assist our local communities. So it's going to be a busy period through the BAU components of council in the next 100 days, but also focusing on getting the best we possibly can through the state election process. OK, Marcus, so thanks a lot again for your time. Thanks for making yourself available, and I appreciate it. And we'll see you next okay. month. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it, Greg. Bye-bye.